Greetings, one and all, to the most cursed, most cringiest corner of the internet. A YouTube channel content creator actively alienating everyone in both the analog and digital world. Well, welcome and good evening, wonderful dice of all alignments. I am Lunar D8. A light breeze causes the naked branch and overhead to rattle like wooden wind chimes. This is a popular retreat for couples in the summer. The deciduous trees provide a beautiful green canopy far out of sight of teachers and fellow students. But now, in late winter, it feels like I'm standing under a pile of kindling. I breathe into my cupped hands and rub them together furiously to prevent them from numbing in this cold. Just how long am I expected to wait out here anyway? I'm sure the note said 4 o'clock p.m. Ah yes, the note slipped between the pages of my math book while I wasn't looking. As far as cliches go, I'm more a fan of the letter in the locker, but at least this show a bit of initiative. As I ponder <coughs> the meaning of the note, the snowfall gradually thickens, the snowflakes silently falling from the white painted sky are the only sign of time passing in this stagnant world. Their slow descent upon the frozen forest makes it seem like time has slowed to a crawl. The rustling of dry snow underfoot startles me, interrupting the quiet mood. Someone is approaching me from behind. So, you came. A hesitating barely audible question. However, I recognize the owner of that dainty voice instantly. I feel my heart skip a beat. It's a voice I've listened to hundreds of times, but never as more than an eavesdropper to a conversation. I turn to face this voice, the voice of my dreams, and my heart begins to race. I don't want to know. I got a note telling me to wait here. It was yours. Damn it, I spent all afternoon trying to come up with a good line, and that was the result. Pathetic. Um, yes, I asked a friend to give you that note. I'm so glad you got it. A shy, joyous smile that makes me so tense I couldn't move a single muscle, even if I tried. My heart is pounding now, as if it were trying to burst out from my chest and claim this girl for itself. So, uh, here we are, out in the cold. Once again, the wind stirs up the branches. The cacophonous noise is music to my ears. A wakano flinches over so slightly against the gust of the wind. As it passes, she writes herself, as if supported by some new confidence. Her eyes lock off mine and she lazily twirls her tongue. Dark, long, dark hair around her finger. All the while the anxious beating of my heart grows louder. My throat is tight. I doubt I could even force a word out if I tried. You see, I wanted to know if you'd go out with me. I stand there motionless, save for my pounding heart. I wanted to say something reply, but my vocal cords feel like they've been stretched. B 
beyond the breaking point. Uh, a sow? I reach up to massage my throat. But this only sends spikes of blinding pain along my arm. A sow? My whole body freezes, save for my eyes, which shoot open in terror. A sow? The beating in my chest suddenly stops, and I go weak at the knees. The world around me, the, the canopy of bare branches, the dull winter sky, a wanko running towards me. All of these fade to black. The last things I remember before slipping away are the sounds of wanko screaming for help and the incessant clatter of the branches above. It's been four months since my heart attack. In that whole time, I can probably count the times I have left this hospital room unsupervised on one hand. Four months is a pretty long time when you're left alone with your thoughts. So I've had plenty of time to come to terms with my situation, arrhythmia. A strange word, a foreign alien one, one that you don't want to be in the same room with. A strange rare condition, it causes the heart to act erratically and occasionally be way too fast. It can be fatal. Apparently I've had it for a long time. They said it was a miracle that I was able to go on so long without anything happening. Is that really a miracle? I guess it was supposed to make me feel better. More appreciative of my life. It really didn't do anything to cheer me up. My parents, I think, were hit harder by the news than I was. They practically had two hemorrhages apiece. I had already had a full day by then to digest everything. To them, it was all fresh. They are even willing to sell our house in order to pay for a cure. Of course, there isn't a cure. Because of the late discovery of this condition, I've had to stay at the hospital to recuperate from the treatments. 
When I was first admitted, it felt as if I was missed. For about a week, my room, the ward was full of flowers. Balloons and cards. But the visitors soon dwindled, and all the get well gifts began trickling down to nothing shortly after. I realized that the only reason I had gotten so many cards and flowers was because sending me their sympathy had turned into a class project. Maybe some people were genuinely concerned, but I doubt it. Even in the beginning, I barely had visitors. By the end of the first month, only my parents came on a regular basis. Awanko was the last to stop visiting. After six weeks, I never saw her again. We never had much to talk about when she visited anyway. We didn't touch the subject that was between us on that snowy day ever again. The hospital? It's not really a place I'd like to live in. The doctors and nurses feel so impersonal and faceless. I guess it's because they are in a hurry and they have a million other patients waiting for them. But it makes me feel uncomfortable. For the first month or so, I asked the head cardiologist every time I saw him for a rough estimate of when I'd be able to leave. He never answered anything in a straightforward way, but told me to wait and see if the treatment and surgeries worked. So I idly observed the scar that those surgeries that left on my chest slowly change its appearance over time, thinking of it as some kind of omen. I still ask the head cardiologist about leaving, but my expectations are low enough now that I'm not disappointed anymore when I don't get a reply. The way he shuffles around the answer shows that there is at least some hope. At some point, I stopped watching TV. I don't know why, I just did. Maybe it was the wrong kind of escapism for my situation. I started reading instead. There was a small library at the hospital, although it was more like a storeroom for books. I began working my way through it. One small stack <coughs> at a time. After consuming them, I would go back for more. I found that I liked reading, and I think I even became a bit addicted. I started feeling naked without a book in my hands, but I loved the stories. That was what my life was like. The days became increasingly harder to distinguish from each other, differing only by the book I was reading and the weather outside. It felt like time blurred into some kind of gooey mass. I was trapped inside instead of moving within. A week could go by without me really noticing it. Sometimes I'd pause in realization I didn't know what the day of the week it was, but other times all the things that surrounded me would painfully crash into my consciousness. Through the barrier of nonchalance, I had set up for myself. The pages of my book would start to feel sharp and burning hot, and the heaviness in my chest would become so hard to bear that I had to put the book aside and just lay down for a while 
looking at the ceiling as if I was going to cry. But that happened only rarely, and I couldn't even cry. Today, the doctor comes in and gives me a smile. He seems excited, but not very. It's like he is trying to make an effort to be happy on my behalf. My parents are here. It's been a few days since I've last seen them. Both of them are even sort of dressed up. Is this supposed to be some kind of special occasion? It's not a party. There is the ritual the head cardiologist has. He takes his time, sorting his papers, and then setting them aside, as if to make a point of the pointlessness of what he has just did. Then he casually sits down on the edge of the bed next to mine. He looks me in the eyes for a moment. Hello, Asao. How are you today? I don't answer him, but I smile a little back at him. I believe that you can go home. Your heart is stronger now, and with some precautions, you should be fine. We have all your medications sorted out. I'll give your father the prescription. The doctor hands a sheet of paper to my dad, whose expression turns wooden as he reads it quickly. So many. I take it from his hand and take a look for myself, feeling numb. How am I supposed to react to this? absurdly long list of medications. Staring back at me for the paper seems insurmountable. They all blend together in a sea of letters. This is insane. Side effects, adverse effects. Contrain dications and dosages are listed line after line with cold precision. I try to read them, but it's so futile. I can't understand any of it. Attempting to only makes me feel sicker. All this for the rest of my life. Every day. I'm afraid that is the best we can do at this point. However, new medications are always being developed. So, I wouldn't be surprised to see that list fade over the years. Years? What kind of confidence boost is that? I'd have felt better if you hadn't said anything at all. Also, I've spoken with your parents.
family believe that it would be best if you don't return to your old school. What? Please calm down, Saul. Listen to what the doctor has to say. Calm down. The way he says it tells me he knew full well that I wouldn't like it. Am I going to be homeschooled? Whatever my concern shows, it's ignored. We all understand that your education is paramount. However, I don't think that it's wise for you to be without supervision. At least... Not until we're sure that your medication is suitable. So I've spoken to your parents about a transfer. It's a school called Yamaku Academy that specializes in dealing with disabled students. Disabled? What? Am I? It has a 24-hour nursing staff, and it's only a few minutes from a highly regarded general hospital. The majority of students live on the campus. Think of it as a boarding school of sorts. It's designed to give students a degree of independence while keeping help nearby. Independence. As a school for disabled kids, don't try to disguise that fact. If it was really that free, there wouldn't be a 24-hour nursing staff, and you wouldn't make a hospital being nearby a selling point. Of course, it's only if you want to go, but your mother and I aren't really able to homeschool you. We went out there and had a look a couple weeks back. I think you'd like it. It looks like I really don't have a choice. Compared to other heart problems, people in your condition usually tend to live long lives. You'll need a job one day, and this is a good opportunity to continue your education. This isn't an opportunity. Don't call it an opportunity. Don't call it a goddamn opportunity. Well, you should be excited. I had the chance to go back to school. I remember you wanted to return to school. And while it's not the same one, a special school, that's an insult. That is what I want to say. It's a step down. It's not what you think. All the students, they were pretty active in their own sort of way. It's geared towards students that can still get around and learn, but just need a little help. In one way or another. Your father's right, and many of the graduates of the school have gone on to do amazing things. A person doesn't have to be held back by their disability. One of my colleagues in another hospital was a graduate. I don't care. A person doesn't have to be held back by their disability? That's what a disability is. I really hate that something so important was decided for me. But what can I do about it? 
than normal, life is out of the question now. It's funny. I had always thought my life was actually kind of boring, but now I miss it. I want to protest, I want to blame this lack of reaction on shock or fatigue. I could easily yell out something now. Something about how I can go back to school anyway, but no. I don't say anything. The fact is, I know now it's futile. I look around the room, feeling very tired of all of this. The hospital, the doctors, my condition, everything. I don't see anything that would make me feel any different. There really isn't a choice. I know this, but the thought of going to a disabled school, what are those even like? As much as I try to put a positive spin on this, it's very difficult. But let me try. A clean slate isn't a bad thing. That is all I can think of to get me through this. At least I still have something. Even if it is a special school. It's something. It's a fresh start. And my life isn't over. It would be a mistake to just resign myself to thinking that. At the very least, I'll try to see what my new life looks like. The gate looked far too pompous for what it was. In fact, gates in general seem to do that, but this one especially so. Red bricks, wrought iron black and gray plaster, assembled into a hole that didn't feel welcoming at all. I wondered if it looked like what a gate for a school should look like, but couldn't really decide. Probably no. Of course I didn't want to get stuck on thinking about the gate for too long, but I entered through it with a brisk pace that felt surprisingly good. Moving forward feels good. So I walk towards the main building of Yamaku Academy with this brisk pace. I'm alone as my parents are taking my stuff to the dorms and there's supposed to be someone waiting for me. 
The grounds are incredibly lush, filled with green. It doesn't feel like the kind of grounds a school would have, more like a park with a clean walkway. Going past trees and the smell of fresh cut grass and all their park like things. Words like clean and hygienic pop into my mind, and it makes me shudder. I shake them off. Stay open minded now. It's your new life. You have to take it as it comes. That's what I tell myself. A few big buildings loom behind the leafy canopies. Too big and too many for just a school. Everything seems off. It's different from what I thought I knew about schools. It's an uncanny valley. Even though I was told that this is my new school, in the back of my head it doesn't feel like one. I wonder if the feeling is real or caused by my expectations of a school for the disabled. Speaking of that, I don't see anyone else here. It's kind of eerie. It makes me wish there was somebody here so I could anchor myself to something tangible instead of having this feeling that I stepped into another dimension. The trees hum with the wind and the green hues are flashing all around me catch my attention. It makes me think about the hospitals again. How they say that the operating rooms are painted green because green is a calming color. So why am I feeling so anxious despite all this greenery? Only after a few, I stand in the front of the haughty main building I surprised myself by realizing why the gate bothered me. It was the last chance I had to turn back. Even if I had no life I could return to. But still, after entering, there was absolutely no way I could go back anymore. Feeling nervous, and with this realization set in my head, I opened the front door. A tall man of bad posture notices me as I enter. We're the only people in the lobby. So it's only logical. You must be... Niki? Nikai. So you are. Excellent. I'm your homeroom teacher in science. My name is Mutao. Welcome. We exchange a handshake that is neither firm nor sloppy. He looks at his watch. The head nurse asks you for a brief check-in visit, but there's no time for that now. Oh. Should I go later? Yes, afternoon is probably fine. We should get going and introduce you to the rest of the class. They're waiting already. Waiting for me. I don't really like being the center of attention. But I guess it's inevitable in a situation like this. Somehow not knowing what is waiting for me makes me feel really nervous. Thinking of this, I almost miss what the teacher is saying. Do you want to introduce yourself to the class? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. I mean, isn't that normal? Of course. But not everyone likes to be the center of attention. I'm probably one of those people. But I guess I should be the one to give the first impression of myself. Right. But it's no problem. Let's go then. My heart is pounding on my chest, and it keeps me thinking about my condition. As I follow the teacher up the stairs. The third door down the third floor corridor is marked as the classroom for class three three. Muta opens the door and enters. Good morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late again. I hesitate for a split second at the door, freezing at the spot. Hey, get a grip. This is a big step, I know that, but there isn't any point in worrying so much about it. At least, not this soon. I follow the teacher into the classroom and look around, partially so I won't have to meet the curious gaze of my new classmates. It's pretty spacious. The ceiling is unusually high, and there's lots of space left over around and in between the desks. An entire wall taken up by blackboards and the high old-fashioned windows only make it seem larger. The students' desks are just standard wooden desks with a shelf underneath for books and wooden chairs with metal frames. Simple and efficient. I stop walking in front of the classroom and to face the other students. They all look normal, like students in other school. But then, why would they be here? They're probably like me and have something wrong with them. Only it's not just immediately obvious. Then I notice that one of the girls seems to be missing the thumb on her right hand. It's a little jarring. Despite the natural tendency to listen when someone's talking about you. I tune out the teacher's speech halfway, though while he still introduces me to the class. I notice a flash of dark hair and see that someone is looking at me. A girl with really long straight hair. That is pretty eye-catching. As she sees me looking back at her, she covers her face with her hands, as if it will make her invisible. There is only one boy with a cane, leaning against the lockers at the rear of the class. It's weird seeing someone young, so with a cane. Another girl seems to be making some weird hand motions. Sign language? She peers at me over the rims of her glasses, then goes back to what she's doing. She's kind of cute. So is the cheery looking girl with pink hair sitting next to her. She's really hard to miss and I don't know how I didn't notice her the moment I walked in. Please welcome our newest classmate. He claps his hands and so does everyone else except one girl in the first row who has only one hand. I cringe a little, but I hide it by bowing and thanks for applause I did not deserve. A collective silence tells me that I should open my mouth now. <coughs> so I'm Hisao Nakai, and after that my hobbies are reading and soccer. I hope to get along with everyone else, even though I'm a new student, and after that I'm being so boring, 
This is exactly like every other self-introduction ever. I should say something more. Something more exciting. I end up saying nothing. And the teacher picks up from there. Everyone seems to be satisfied, even with what little I said. Though, a few girls are whispering to each other, throwing glances at me. It could have gone worse. I listen to the teacher as he drones on about getting along with while letting my gaze sweep across the classroom. Everyone seems to be listening to him intently when he's done. They clap their hands again, which feels a little weird thing to do. The first row girl claps on this round with her one hand against her other wrist that ends in a bandaged stump. It makes me feel a little bit bad. We're going to be doing some group work today, so that'll give you a chance to talk with everyone. Is that okay with you? Yeah. It's fine with me. That's good. You can work with Hakamichi. She is the class representative.